Yesterday's Prophecies for Today's World. But greater is he who is in you than he who is in this world. The Holy Spirit dwells in every believer, and he is in you, and you need not be afraid. And now, Hal Lindsey's Bible study of the book of John. Now, one thing you'll learn that the Apostle John, when he keeps repeating something, it's for a real purpose. That John kept saying the next day, again the next day in chapter 1 and so forth. And he counted off actually four days there. But then when you look at John chapter 2, verse 1, John says on the third day. And so it sounded like it was kind of contradictory because he had already counted off four days in the first chapter. But uh, if you look at it carefully, he's being very careful in what he's saying. Because you see, there was the first day that he started on. And then after that first day, when he was told by John the Baptist, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, that next day he met Jesus. And that's when he was born again. And so when he says in chapter 2, verse 1, on the third day, he's saying, It was the third day of my real new spiritual life. So you see, he's got a reason for everything he does. In John chapter 4, remember, he was, uh, he was uh, talking to the woman of Samaria. And through this woman who was uh, uh, probably uh, a woman that had a lot of trouble uh, morally, and yet he picked her to be the one that he would talk to and send up into the uh, town of Sychar to be his real evangelist. And so uh, through this woman, the whole town was brought out to talk to him. And so when they, uh, they came out, it says in uh, verse 40, so when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. Very significant. And many more believe because of his word. Now I want you to take note of that. The Samaritans, who are they? Well, they were, uh, most of them were in some part Jewish, but they were heavily mixed in with uh, Gentile blood. And so the Jews considered them really Gentiles and a lower kind of Gentile. But uh, even though the Jewish leaders and most of the Jews were rejecting Jesus' message, when these Samaritans come out, well, they had one miracle that uh, the woman of Samaria talked about, and that miracle was that he was able to tell her everything she had done without knowing her. So he used his gift of prophets. And uh, yet that's the only miracle he did. When they came out and they talked with him, it's very careful to say that uh, he stayed there with them two days and many more believed because of his words, not miracles, his words. And verse 42, and they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. You see, you have to be able to put yourself back in that time frame. For them to understand that is absolutely incredible. But they did because they were open and Certainly, they were sinful, like all of us. But they were open, and they believed what Jesus told them. 
the greatest leader, the, the greatest teacher of Israel, Nicodemus, we saw in the chapter three, Jesus talked to him and what Jesus said to Nicodemus are some of the most sublime words we know about the gospel. I mean, it was to Nicodemus he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believes in him will not be condemned. But he who does not believe has been condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Those sublime words and many more he said to Nicodemus. And at the end of it, he said, how can these things be? But here to these uneducated Gentiles who were open, it says, because we believe because of your words. So he stayed with them two days. All right? Now, when was the Gospel of John written in John's life in relation to what? It was after he had already written what? The book of Revelation. So John knew a lot about the future, didn't he? Now, you have to factor that in with what we're about to read. Now it says, see, John, John tells us things that are very simple. And, uh, you know, if someone wants to, to investigate the Bible, uh, I never tell them, I never tell them to read Genesis. I tell them, read the Gospel of John. Because it is on one level so simple that anyone can understand it if they are open. And a young believer can read it and get a lot of things out. But there are messages below the level of the simple in it that go way beyond. And John interwove some things in here that we're going to see go way beyond. And guess what? We're going to talk about prophecy tonight. Because hidden in here, for the Holy Spirit to unravel to us is a very important prophetic message. All right. Now, it says in verse 43, after the two days, he went forth from there to Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. Very interesting, isn't it? He's been with the Gentiles for two days. Then he goes to the Jews, and the first thing it says, a prophet has no honor among his own people. All right, and then he, it says, so when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did in Jerusalem. He did a lot of miracles there at the feast, for they themselves had gone to the feast. Therefore, he came again to Cana of Galilee, and so on. And so here is this uh, nobleman, we, we studied this. He comes and he's desperate because his son is uh, near death, he's sick. And uh, this man, is, he, he walks all the way over from uh, Capernaum to Cana. And uh, that's at least a good hard day's walk. And he walks there and he comes to see Jesus and ask him to come down and heal his son. Now look at Jesus' response. Verse 48. So Jesus said to them, or him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. So here he is after two days with the Gentiles. He comes back to, his, uh, to the Jews. Contrast this with what John told us about the Gentiles and how they responded to Jesus. You see, they believed in him because of his word. So he stayed two days. When he comes back to his own people, he says in disgust, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply won't believe. They believe because of his word. 
I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. For I will be like a lion to Ephraim. It's another word for some of the ten tribes of uh, Israel, the northern kingdom. And like a young lion to the house of Judah. Now that Judah was the southern kingdom. Remember, they had a civil war, they split. And uh, he says, I, even I, will tear to pieces and go away, and I will carry away, and there will be none to deliver. Now this is a prophecy of when God would finally have enough with Israel's unbelief, and he would do what he predicted through Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 63 through 68, where uh, Moses, looking into the future of this, he said, uh, after he said there would first be one destruction of the nation by a great nation from the north. That was the Babylonians' destruction. Then he said there would be a second one. He said, this time I will scatter you from one end of heaven to the other and through all the nations. And there you will have no assurance for your life. You'll fear day and night. He was talking about the second dispersion that began with the 70 A.D. destruction of Israel by the Romans. This is predicting that second destruction and dispersion where he says, I will tear you like a lion and there'll be none to deliver. And uh, he says in verse 15, the prophet Hosea, I will go away. This is the Lord of Israel speaking. I will go away and return to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. All right. So he predicts there's going to be, in the future of Israel here, there's going to be this great destruction and scattering of the people. The nation destroyed, the people scattered throughout every nation under uh, uh, on earth, and that uh, they would have a terrible time fearing for their life day and night. And then he says about this, he says, I will return to my place. Now, how can the Lord return to his place? God knows his place, doesn't he? So how does he get out of his place? <laughs> when he stepped out of eternity into time and became the man, Jesus Christ. And so he said, and Jesus was man and God inseparably united in one person, second person that God had. And when he was rejected, what did he do? He returned to his place where he came from. He said, we'll see this in John over and over again. I came down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. See, he knew where he came from. Well, he re Hosea predicts this. He will return to his place. Now, look at chapter 6, verse 1. Come, let us return to the Lord, they will say. For he has torn us, but he will heal us. He, he has wounded us, but he will bandage us. Now, look at this. He will revive us after what? Two days. And he will raise us up uh, uh, again on the third day. Now, we know how long the third day is, don't we? That's the kingdom that was predicted for them. And John, who wrote the book of Revelation, is the one who revealed how long the third day is. How long is it? A thousand years. All right. So if the third day he's going to raise them to life, and the third day, if that's a thousand years, that tells us how long the two days are, doesn't it? Two thousand years. Now, you say, oh boy, we can get out the chart and we can figure out exactly when Jesus is coming. No, we can't because, uh, first of all, we're not real sure about the calendar of Jesus' life. We're not real sure. That's number one. And uh, 
we're not sure whether he's using Gentile or Jewish time. I would say he's probably using Jewish time. And 2,000 years uh, would probably be from the day he departed this earth. He said when he goes to his place. So, all I know is it's real close. <laughs> 2,000 years will end in the not distant future. And I really believe that John was thinking about that and the symbolism of that passage that he gave us. You see, he was with the Gentiles for 2,000 years. Why? Because when he went to them, they believed. And they didn't have to have a lot of miracles. They believed because of his word. Right? I believed because of God's word. I didn't have any miracles. I was sitting on a tugboat reaching for a reason to live when I was reading a Gideon's New Testament, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, and reading those words, the Holy Spirit brought me to life. And it's, it's been, it, it, you know, we could all give a testimony about how it happened with us. But it's God's word that did it. It's God's word. I got some good news for you. Our two days are almost up. And I really believe the Lord is giving us a hint all about it. And all of this, you see, if that were the only thing we had, I'd say, well, it might be a little fancy uh, interpretation there. But that's not the only thing we have. We have a whole scenario of precise predictions that have all come together in one generation, just like they said they would. Prophecies from all different, all kinds of different prophets have all come together in concert in one time frame. It just happens to be around the general time of that ending of 2,000 years since Jesus went to the Gentiles. But he's going to go back to his own people. And let's put a little, uh, let's put some more scripture around this. I mean, I could, if I had the time, I could go through all kinds of scripture that touch on this whole idea. But here's one, uh, here's a, a couple of them in Hosea chapter three, verse five, where it says afterwards, it is after this dispersion, after this terrible time of, uh, suffering, Afterwards, the sons of Israel will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they will come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness in the last days. The last days. They will come trembling. Then uh, turn to Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 12. Behold, in verse 2, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes drunkenness and all the peoples around. And when the siege is against Jerusalem, it will also be against Judea or against Judah. It will come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all peoples. Now, this means the whole world. He's going to make Jerusalem this heavy, heavy burden for the whole world. Well, isn't it? I mean, you know, look how God set this up. Most of the oil discovered belongs to the Muslims, the Arabs. And the West, Western countries need the Arab oil. So whatever makes the Muslims upset, they make the West upset. Because they've got the chokehold on us with the oil, you see. And what do the Muslims get most upset about? Jerusalem. 
So they trouble the whole world over Jerusalem. The whole world. So it says, and then it says, literally in the Hebrew, it says, all who attempt to lift it, that is this heavy stone of Jerusalem, all who try to lift this burden, all who attempt to lift it will be severely injured. Hear that, George Bush. <laughs> Hear that, all of the ones who, every, you know, every president starts thinking about his legacy when he gets to the end of his second term. And it seems like everyone wants to have part of his great legacy. I solved the Middle East conflict. And they start pushing Israel to make more concessions. Whereas the Muslims have not kept one word of any treaty they signed. <coughs> Israel's kept it all and they want them to make more concessions. It's insanity. But that's the insanity the Bible predicted would be here, see? Now, in that day, declares the Lord, verse 4, I will strike every horse with bewilderment and his rider with madness, but I will watch over the house of Judah and I will strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. You know, it's interesting. Uh, the only form of uh, mobile warfare that this prophet knew about was a horse. But you transpose that over to today. He's talking about military conflict. Israel's planes just flew deep into Syrian territory and blew up a nuclear plant. How? They blinded their military radar. And I think that's just the first step. God said, I'm going to strike them with blindness. Verse 5, then the clans of Judah will say in their hearts, a strong support for us are the inhabitants of Jerusalem through the Lord of hosts of their God. In that day I will make the clans of Judah like a fire pot among pieces of wood and a flaming torch among sheaves so that they will consume on the right and hand and on the left and all the surrounding peoples while the inhabitants of Jerusalem again dwell on their own sites in Jerusalem. Now you see, this is talking about something that's going to happen in the tribulation near the end, just before the second coming of Christ. God is going to give superhuman strength to the Israelites who live in and around Jerusalem and in, and in Judea, which are this, you know, the southern end of Israel. And it says he is going to, uh, they're going to be at the point of being wiped out as a people, and all of a sudden he's going to give them superhuman strength. Verse 7, the Lord also will save the tents of Judah first so that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem will not be magnified above Judah. In that day, notice it keeps saying in that day, in that day, in that day, all the way through this chapter. In that day the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the one who is feeble among them in that day will be like David. And the house of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. And in that day, I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Wow. Why is he going to do that? Verse 10. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. And they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over firstborn. You see, that's what's going to turn everything. There's going to be a believing remnant that in the midst of all of this, and they see the Lord defending them, they're going to turn to him with all their hearts, and then they're going to see who he is. Because it says here very carefully, now remember, this was written 2,550 years ago, Zechariah. They will look upon me, whom they have pierced. You know, Jesus 
is their God. In order to let the Israelites finish the seven allotted years that they had been given by Daniel, they've still got seven years on their time clock allotted to them to finish what God called them to do. In order for them to do that, he has to get us out of the way. Our two days will be up. And it's into the third day that God will turn the Israelites back to him. And we have to be taken out of the way so they can uh, become the representatives of God and, and find him themselves. What an exciting time to be alive, huh? It's so, so incredible. But I just thought it was important to bring out that the Apostle John was sowing bits and pieces of all of this when he said he stayed with the Gentiles two days. And after that, he came back to his own people. And he found the same mess. Unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. Well, he's going to give them some signs and wonders. The whole world is going to be shaken up. Father, thank you in Jesus' name for the hope that you've given us. We thank you, Lord, that though things look bad on the, on the human front, that everything that's Everything that's happening is fitting into exactly what you predicted. And it shows us that we have hope because we know that Jesus is coming forth very soon. And we know that we have time and the power from you to make the most of this time and bring others to personal faith in Jesus Christ. I pray that this will all be a blessing to everyone who's here in Jesus' name. Amen. Join us next week for the continuation of How Lindsay's Bible Study of the Book of John. But when you really get a grip on the fact that Jesus so saves you, when you simply admit your sins and receive the gift of pardon, that you are already in heaven as far as he's concerned. You can find more of Hal Lindsey at his website, www.howlindsey.com. There you can access our video and article archives. Visit our online store for Hal Lindsey CDs, books, and other specialty items. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to Hal Lindsey Media Ministries, P.O. Box 470-470, Tulsa, Oklahoma. 74147. You can also support this ministry online. Visit howlindsay.com or call 1 888 Rapture.